distracted, so we don't want to be distracted, right? Uh, I want to make sure that we get the right information so that for we can do very well when we get assessed. And we don't want to say, oh, I don't remember this because I wasn't paying attention. That wouldn't be good. Um, so last class, we talked about the lips, right? And on the lips, guys, we talked about it basically it resembles like a circle, but it's been elongated, right? One side is kind of, or one, um, one side is kind of elongated. Now, for this kind of review, I'm just going to focus on the hyperbola, or the, sorry, ellipse, where it's elongated horizontally. But we also know we looked at it where it could be elongated vertically, right? Um, so we talked about the center is kind of like in the circle, where the center is h comma k, all right? So we had our center, which was represented h comma k. And then we had these kind of two like radiuses that we kind of talked about, or distances from the center from the short like kind of distance in here. Because it's not a circle. It doesn't have a radius. Like the distance from the center to all the points is not, is not equidistant, right? They're different. But we kind of had these like this long, these endpoints that were at the long version, and then the shorter version. So the endpoints that were the farthest away from the center were what we call our vertices. And if you guys remember, the vertices were a distance a away. And you guys wrote that down in your notes, so I'm not going to rewrite that. But the distance from your center to your vertices was a. However, I am going to write what the coordinate point would be, because these are coordinate points. So if I wanted to figure out what the coordinate point of my vertice was, I would just take my h coordinate of my center and subtract a, right? Because that's like moving it to the left. You don't want to do it to k, because that's up and down. You want to do it to your h. Over here, I would have h plus a comma k. So those are like your two vertices. So then we talked about our covertices. Sometimes just label them as CB. And those are at the endpoints of like this shorter kind of axis. And the distance from the center to your covertices was B, B, right? So if I wanted to find what the values of these covertices were, I could just add B to my K coordinate of my um, center. And then this would be h comma k minus b. All right. And then the last two points that we talked about, guys, was the foci. And remember, the foci is a distance c away from the center. So the distance from the center to your foci is c. So again, if I wanted to kind of write the coordinate points, I would need to write them left and right from the center. So it would be h minus c comma k and h plus c comma k. So last class period, I just, told, I just talked about A, B, and C, and we just talked about those as the distances. Now I'm just giving you guys a little bit of visualization of them, because you know, today what we're going to do is we're going to give you a piece of information. You guys are going to have to write the equation of, of the ellipse. So there's a couple of things that's kind of important that I think you guys can understand. First of all, this, length, this larger axis that we called where the vertices lie on, the foci lie on, and the center, is what we call our major axis. All right. So previously we just talked about vertices and a, but the distance from vertice to, or vertex to vertex, or the distance between your two vertices, is like from here to here is a, from here to here is a. So from here to here has to be two a. Okay. So that's going to be helpful for us. The major axis is two a. Um, also, what's kind of important about the major axis? Let's see. The vertices, foci, and center all lie there, right? So we can say the vertices, foci, and center, those all lie on the major axis, correct? Could we also say that the center is the midpoint? Does that kind of work? Does it look like the center is the midpoint of your two vertices? Yes? No? Yeah, all right. Um, let's go and take a look at the minor axis. Well, the minor axis is going to be exactly that. It's going to be the axis from your covertices to your covertices. So if the center to covertices is B, or center to your covertex is B, that means the distance from your covertex to your covertex it has to be 2B. Now, the minor axis is not really as cool as the major axis. It wants to be, but it only has the covertices and the center which lie on it. However, could we also say 
that the center is, again, the midpoint of your covertices, right? And I'm not going to write this down because I think it's you know, kind of obvious, but let's look at the other one. What about the two foci? Is the center the, covert, the midpoint of the two foci? Yes. So this is kind of important, guys, because if I give you these pieces of information, you're going to want to find the center. So you can just find the midpoint of those values to be able to identify the center. Um, let's see. What else is kind of cool? Well, what else do we need to remember? Well, let's go and think about um, what the equation would be of this would be. So since my horizontal major axis, or since my major axis is horizontal, remember that uh, this would be x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. Now, does anybody remember why, it, why is the a squared under the x in this case? Yeah? Right? So? A is always the biggest, though, right? A represents the distance from the center to your vertices, which is always going to be longer from than your center to your covertices. Yes? Since A is horizontally um, oriented, since our major axis is horizontal in this case, we want to make sure our A squared is under our x. So there's a couple things. A is always larger than B. The distance from the center to your vertice is always going to be larger than your distance from your center to your covertice. Now again, guys, we could take this ellipse and flip it this way. Right? So it could do that vertically or horizontally. It doesn't really matter. But understand that A is always larger than B for an ellipse. Right? Well, then does that mean that 2A has to be greater than 2B? Yeah. And does that mean then that A squared has to be greater than B squared? Yes. And again, if you from last class period, that was very important. Because if I gave you the equation, I said, what was A squared? You just had to look at the denominator and say which one's bigger, because A squared was always bigger than B squared. So you looked at the denominator and said, oh, 25 is bigger than 16. 25 is A squared. Right? Remember? Um, now, the important thing is, if you guys look at this equation, we've talked about A, B, and C. But um, if I'm going to give you a piece of information, I want you to write it. Sometimes I'll give you h, k, and a, and b, but sometimes I might give you c. So rather than looking in your phone to see what c would represent, all you simply need to do is remember the formula that a squared minus b squared equals c squared. Right? So that was something that we provided last class period for those of you that are writing on your desk. Um, a squared minus b squared equals c squared. So that was just a relationship we could use, because if you're given two of those variables, ladies and gentlemen, you can find for the third one. Okay. Um, let's see, what other things do we need to remember? Oh, last thing I will talk about is also notice that the major and the minor axis um, cross at the center, right? And then last but not least, let's talk about eccentricity. E equals C over A. So eccentricity, if you guys remember from last class period. Last class period, I, I threw an ellipse on the board. Right? We looked at it, not on our phones, but on, on the board over there. And what we did is we looked at the lips, and I had these dots, but people still were looking on their phones. They weren't even, I mean, I tried to keep on saying, like, no, just look up here. But people were like, no, I'm still so distracted. Like, I can't. So we looked at the board, and we saw this lips. And it had those two little dots, which we eventually called the foci, right? But what happens, if you guys remember, I would like stretch that ellipse, and I would condense that ellipse. But I, I brought this ellipse so close that these little foci dots kept on getting closer and closer to the center till eventually, and eventually they became the center. And do you guys remember what that shape of that graph was? Circle. Circle, right? So when the foci became at like the distance from the center to the, to the foci was literally 0, we had a perfect circle. So the representation of eccentricity when, um, is just your value of c over a. So it's the distance from your center to your foci over the distance from your center to your vertices. And when that value is 0, you're going to have a perfect circle. So when your eccentricity is 0, you have a circle. Now, as we started to pull the ellipse apart, those foci got closer and closer to the vertices. right? And as it got closer and closer to the vertices, what happened was our ellipse got elongated, elongated, very, very elongated. So Obviously, guys, the foci, to create an ellipse, the foci cannot be larger than our 
than our ellipse, because then obviously it'd be outside, and then we'd have a different type type of graph, which we'll talk about later. Um, but so, but once it gets to one, they're going to be the same representation. If they have, they're equal to one, then they're going to be exactly the same. You're not going to have a uh, ellipse anymore. But either way, the, what I want to represent to you with eccentricity, first of all, if I give you something eccentricity, it's easy to identify C and A because it's literally in the formula, C over A. So therefore, that's nice. Because if I give you C or A, could you find B? Yeah, once you have A and B, you could plug it into the equation. You just need to find H and K. right? So if you're sleeping, that doesn't help. Um, but the main idea of eccentricity is it basically just tells you guys the shape of it. So the closer it is to 0, the more perfect of a circle it is. The closer that ratio is to 1, just the more elongated your ellipse is. Okay? And you're not going to be asked anything about that. You know, but I just want you guys to kind of, one, explain eccentricity to you, but then also so you guys can see how that ratio, or at least you guys are going to use that ratio. Okay? Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any preguntas? All right. You guys seem tired, distracted today. Yeah. I got people. Yes? Huh? Eccentricity, again, is just telling you like the shape of the ellipse. So the closer eccentricity is to 0, the more it's like a perfect circle. The farther, the closer it is to 1, the more like stretched it is. So the way that eccentricity works is like you can think about eccentricity is very common like with our solar system. Like different planets have elliptical orbits, right? Some planets are like really far orbits. That's why we only see them like so far, like thing, because they only get close enough so far, like some time. Some of them, like our moon, for instance, has like a kind of a circular kind of orbit, right? So the eccentricity can kind of tell us like those orbits and so forth and so on. Okay. All right. Last, 